Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Pianti, and I am joined, as usual, by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing well. How are you, Cass? I'm doing good. We are talking about, I guess, to me, what was the biggest news of the day, which was the sentencing of Virgil Griffith, who was this guy who's quite fluent in cryptocurrencies, Ethereum particularly. He was a... Uh head of special projects and a senior researcher, but he wasn't considered one of the founders. And basically, he took a trip to North Korea to show them how to evade sanctions. And that pretty much sums it up. He kind of bragged about it, and then they went after him. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit more, but I, I don't usually do this. But I want to start this off because North Korea is something I've been obsessed with for like a very, very long time. Uh, there's a huge South Korean population here in Los Angeles. So I grew up around like a lot of my best friends growing up in all the schools that I attended were South Korean. So I've always been really interested in that conflict. And it is a crazy story. So I, I just want to quickly recommend two documentaries to everybody. The first one is called A State of Mind, which I'll leave a link in the show notes. I think you have to pay for it, unfortunately. There might be a YouTube video that you can find, but I'm not going to link to it. So good luck. Um, Otherwise, uh, yeah, a, a State of Mind is a documentary that kind of follows. There's an event in North Korea called the Mass Games that are put on. I don't know if it's every year or every four years. It might be every four years. And they're the largest event in the world. And they're put on for the leader, one of the Kims, whoever that Kim is at the time. And this documentary follows two young North Korean girls who are gymnasts and are trying to be like front of the mass games for the you know supreme leader. And what I really loved about that documentary was how it humanized a, a country and a people that I think we in America try our best to dehumanize. Like, they're just pure evil. Everything about North Korea is bad. There can't be, you know, human beings there. Um, so I think this does a really good job of comparing some of the things that they do with the things that we do. They have like a Pledge of Allegiance. Of course, it's to the Kims, but I remember doing that as a kid. I'm sure most uh, everybody in America remembers having to do the Pledge of Allegiance every morning in, in school. And yeah, like their dreams felt so similar to the dreams of American children, which the best way to humanize any, I think, any evil nation state is to just talk to kids because they're they're just trying to live their best lives they're not like us with our weird evil intentions and stuff so and by us i just mean adults i'm not talking about crypto critics corner in particular though you know that's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other tale um <laughs> but yeah so i highly recommend that if you just want to understand the humanity of what's going on in north korea but for a more typical understanding, if you don't know anything about what happens in North Korea, about the concentration camps, if you don't know about how horrible the Kim regime has been, there's a documentary called Secret State of North Korea. It's by Frontline PBS. You can find it on YouTube. They made it, I think, two or three years ago. It's up to date. And as far as the U.S. audience is concerned, I, I think it's pretty fair regarding at least the negative aspects of the Kims. But we're talking about North Korea right now because of Virgil Griffith and what happened. So, yeah, why don't you give a fuller explanation, Bennett, of why he was sentenced to over five years in prison today? Yeah. It's really an interesting story. And you mentioned the conference already, but there was this whole big lead up to the conference where you could tell that he was trying to lay the groundwork to outright help North Korea evade sanctions. And it seems to be rooted in his ideological belief that these sanctions themselves are unethical, are unjust, and so evading them, even if illegal, is a moral thing to do. And I can certainly imagine that argument. But I, I don't think documenting it in writing as thoroughly as he did is a prudent decision. And that was one of the most interesting things to me, really, in reading the sentencing memo is how much of this stuff was just explicitly written down. Um, at one point he wrote, if you find someone in North Korea, we'd love to make an Ethereum trip to DPRK and set up an Ethereum node. And when questioned whether the plan made economic sense, his response was, it does actually, it'll help them evade or it'll help them circumvent the current sanctions on them. Like, 
even from the beginning, well before this conference was even planned, his stated goal was to help North Korea evade sanctions. And he just continues to do this in conversation after conversation. Uh, like he had this one British friend who does, who does tours of North Korea, who he was communicating with and who the Department of Justice got the communications for. And like he was talking about shipping in a mining rig and possibly helping them set up a cryptocurrency exchange and all of these different things repeatedly referencing the fact that these things would be helpful in evading sanctions. Being a criminal is not something I we urge anyone to do. You shouldn't go about breaking laws. Uh, even generally, if you disagree with them, it's best to not break them if you can avoid it. But if you are going to do that and you are going to break the law on a nation state level, my honest recommendation is at least don't fucking put it in writing, please. Holy good lord. This is, like, just incredible. Yeah, the things that are being... Another benefit of an Ethereum node in DPRK is it'll make it possible for them to avoid sanctions on money transfer. This seems like something that would interest them. Why are you putting this in writing? Uh, what if they're funding their drug trade and nuclear program with crypto? Griffith replied, unlikely, but they'd probably like to start doing such. So why are you helping them, bro? What are you doing? I it's um it's some real kind of megalomaniac behavior when you, this person is recognizing all of the problems with what they're doing, the fact that what they're doing is illegal and easy for them to get caught doing as much. And then when you see these pictures that are getting shared on social media afterwards where he says stuff like uh avoid sanctions, yay, happy face, you know, like that just, I, I, these people are really, really smart. And I don't, I don't doubt that actually. Like this, I'm sure this guy is incredibly intelligent and I'm not going to try to deny that in any sense, but I think he's obviously really smart with cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And it's interesting you said that he seems like a megalomaniac because part of the defense strategy they settled on was the fact that while he was in jail leading up to this sentencing, a psychiatrist diagnosed him with narcissistic personality disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And they tried to use that as extenuating circumstances that should affect his sentencing. So in many sense, he is a megalomaniac, right? He's got narcissistic personality disorder and he does clearly become fixated on certain ideas, even when those ideas repeatedly get pushback from people saying, if you do this, it seems like you'll be breaking the law and you'll go to prison. <laughs> So we'll get back on track here, but basically throughout this memo, which we will also link to this uh, sentencing memo from the U.S. government, basically lays out what he went and did while he was in North Korea, which was to repeatedly tell them, uh, here's how you can evade sanctions with the blockchain. Here's how to use cryptocurrency to further gain control over your population. I mean, I think that stuff is what actually grosses me out, is the stuff where he's talking about like the central bank of North Korea being able able to control their money even further and control the population with the money even further. Like that goes against every every principle that these libertarians and voluntarists are supposed to be about. So it's incredibly disturbing to me, really. Like it's not it's not even about going and help. Like you could I, I guess you could argue this is for any government contractor at all who's going and working with the U.S. government or who whomever. I, I get that there's a grossness to, to doing that work regardless but like helping the kims it's really not good and there was specifically a part of his work there that i thought was especially bad um and he describes how basically north korea could put a module on a missile launch the missile and then have an oracle solution that waits to see if sanctions get lifted if sanctions get lifted, the missile deactivates harmlessly. If they don't, the U.S. or South Korea gets bombed, right? And he talks about this at the conference. But then the other thing that struck me was he had this later conversation with someone identified as individual one to talk about what actually setting up this type of Oracle solution would look like. And he also discusses with this same individual one, who I think might be Vitalik, but we don't actually know that for certain, 
he discusses with individual one how North Korea wants his help to set up an auger prediction market contract where any journalist that comes in will need to make a deposit. And if there's unflattering coverage of North Korea from this journalist, then they'll lose their deposit. Like he is specifically helping enable some of the gross abuses of the Kims. I mean, there is a part that was in there where a friend of his specifically says like, oh, did they take you on a tour of the concentration camps too? And he's like, oh, well, they acknowledge that they exist. And you're just like, isn't that enough? <laughs> isn't Shouldn't that be enough for you to be like questioning whether or not this is a regime that you should be doing business with? I mean, they have concentration camps that they admit to. I like, I granted, I'm I, like I've been really obsessed with North Korea for a long time. So the idea of visiting North Korea is actually something I've always wanted to do. Like I, I, I get the desire to go visit the place. I don't get the desire to try to money launder and tax evade and sanction evade and do all this other stuff to help a horrible regime. Like why? It's it's like helping them on a grand scale versus like, I guess if I go as a foreigner and I'm a tourist, like that's also helping them on a, on a smaller scale. But I, I like, I can't imagine. I just can't imagine. And like you said, I mean, I guess if a psychiatrist gave him these diagnoses, I'm not going to question that. And I think mental illness sucks. And clearly, this is not a person who's thinking entirely rationally throughout this stuff. I think that I, I do believe that. Um, and, and that's kind of the tension with this case, right, is he clearly intended to violate the law. He specifically discussed enabling some of these pretty gross abuses of the Kim family, right? Talking about trying to give them... And he talks about being able to get off the first, like, oh, they won't do anything the first time you do something like this. Yeah, and he, he specifically made plans to violate the sanctions, right? And had, like, a counterparty who was going to help him transmit the funds so they could do this. And you can see where his moral argument is coming from. And, like, it makes sense to me insofar as sanctions often do end up being kind of broadly targeted. They hurt a lot of innocent people, right? Hmm. And so it's possible to construct the moral argument that the sanctions themselves are unjust. But he wasn't just specifically trying to help, like, the citizens of North Korea, right? He was working with this regime and trying to give them the ability to, like launch a missile connected to these oracles to try to get more artillery in the DMZ and then to like try to make it so journalists can't write bad things about them. And so he's not just worried about the populace, you know? Yeah. And and I, I hear that and I agree with it as well. But I do think part of the argument as well seems to be that he didn't give them anything. Like he didn't supply them with the stuff they needed to do the things that he said they could do with cryptocurrency. And that like reflecting on that did give me pause and made me think, I mean, I understand he certainly gave them a lot of ideas. Um, and as an expert, hearing those ideas from him maybe push them in, in the direction further than they had been before. But uh it's hard for me to rationalize him not making like an actual transaction, basically getting five years for talking about how they can use OTC desks and stuff, which, yeah, no shit. I, I agree. I, like, of course, they can use OTC desks. I think, as is often the case in the United States, the sentencing seems disproportionate. And I think it's clear that in the middle of this Russia-Ukraine conflict was perhaps the worst political time for his sentencing to come up. Definitely. And they even kind of talk about that in the memo, about how they're almost trying to make an example of him. And it does seem disproportionate to what he was able to successfully accomplish. I agree with that as well. I mean, I think... Uh... I mean, I think what, what, what generally happens, maybe I, I'm not a lawyer, so I have no idea, but I think people usually get time off for good behavior and he's n not been accused of previous stuff. It's a nonviolent crime. Um, so, you know, you hope to see that several of those years get cut off his sentence. Um, but I do think that, like you said, it's, it's way over the top. And I think something that uh, I half don't want to bring this up, but I half feel like we need to, is that he's like a well-to-do white kid and that he expected to be able to just kind of not go to prison. And there might be an argument that if he was any other race 
or gender, perhaps, he could be facing even more time in prison than right now and certainly wouldn't have ever thought like, oh, I can get away with it the first time. That's a very privileged mindset to be in. What you're saying is making me think about how since his indictment, there's been a group of people in the cryptocurrency community who've tried to almost like lionize him, make him like a hero, a martyr for some grand cause. And like that doesn't really seem consistent with the facts of this case, you know? He wasn't some grand hero. And even if it was at least in part rooted in a belief about the morality of sanctions, there's still talks in his messages about how the business that partners with him to build this will end up making these profits and they could set up this exchange and do all these things. And so there's absolutely like this bit of selfishness that runs through it. And then like, when his bail was shortened and he was denied bail initially, there was a bunch of people who reacted to that as if it was unthinkable. When in like the messages too, you hear him discussing his plans to like get a second passport and how he tried to renounce his US citizenship. And it's like all the things he's doing, talking about funneling money through China and Singapore, getting this other passport, renouncing his US citizenship, are things that would make him immediately a flight risk. And it seemed like because he had already been deified that many people on cryptocurrency Twitter and in the community were aghast that he was initially denied bail. And he ended up on bail for like 10 of the months that he was held so far. But for a period, he was denied it because he was perceived as a flight risk, not without reason in my mind. We don't call people out on this show. So I'm not, the goal is not to name people. But I did see people criticizing the judge for, you know, sentencing him to this. And uh, while we might disagree with 63 months as a rational time period, time frame for, like we said, not having done, he didn't, <laughs> nothing, he didn't, there was no money. There was no money laundering. There was no, like, there was no actual sanctions evasion in terms of, like, he didn't bring a bunch of stuff with him to North Korea and give it to them or something like that. I, it's... It was sanctions evasion in terms of he shouldn't have been there. The State Department literally told him, you cannot go and do this, which I think is actually an important point. The State Department denied him that trip. They said no, and then he still went. And yeah, he did clue them into some ideas that I'm sure China will already help them out with as soon as they are interested. So I, I do think that it's harsh, but criticizing the judge for doing uh, re like all, all together, he's paying $100,000 and, and five years was the smallest time that the prosecutor was asking for. So, the, you know, it's a hefty sentence, but it isn't the worst that he could have gotten. And really criticizing the judge for handing down what's based on the law, a relatively fair sentence, I think is not fair and not who should be being criticized here. You know, you can criticize the U.S. prosecutor, you can criticize uh, the laws and the way they're put in place and who and how they uh, p attack people, who they choose to go after and why. You know, I'm sure there's dozens of people who have actually contracted with sanctioned countries who are not going to prison right now um, just because they've been smarter about it or know the right people. So it's not fair in its totality, but don't attack the justices and the judges for what they're doing. It's uh, it was a weird flex. Yeah, yeah. It it was it seemed to be in line with sentencing guidelines and U.S. sentencing guidelines were often unnecessarily cruel, but. That's a broader issue. Yeah, Virgil is just a really strange character. Like, did you catch the part? Virgil, Virgil. Virgil, sorry. Did you catch the part in the <laughs> sentencing memo where he admitted that he, like, hadn't been filing his tax returns for several years? Like, like one of his friends texts him and goes, uh, if, you, if you had this conversation with the FBI, double check your taxes. That's often how people end up getting in trouble. And he goes, oh, my taxes are fine. Taxes won't be my issue. And then later to another cryptocurrency company, he goes, I discovered I didn't file a tax return for years 2015 through 2018. But weirdly, the IRS hasn't contacted me about it. I'm considering just filing my taxes in 2019 and just pretend I had no one in 2015 to 2018. I know that's illegal. But I was basically a student in 2015 to 2017 doing postdocs. I had less than 100K income on those years. I know this is illegal. <laughs> it's a thing you should stop putting in writing. By the way, I just, 
I actually want to just say this to our listeners, because you can miss filing taxes. You can screw that up, and you can actually just pay fines on it, right? That is not the illegal part. The illegal part that he's talking about is pretending he wasn't working at all. That is absolutely illegal. If you are late, just report it. Just file your taxes. Don't do, don't do what he was suggesting he should do. I, like my understanding is the IRS will even uh, like, like if the fine is large, will enter into like a payment plan with you and do stuff like that. Like they want to collect the taxes. So they want to get paid. Yeah. They don't want you in jail. They want to get paid. They, They're reasonable debt collectors at the end of the day. So I just, it's like, it's do, d- don't, don't. Please, I'm I'm begging our listeners. You know, I'm, I know they're gonna call me a bootlicking statist or something. Please, I'm just begging you. I'm looking out for your best interests. Just, you know, if you didn't file them like he didn't for several years, just file them now. Just file them and pay the late fees, and that'll be the end of it. I swear. Please, you gotta do it. You gotta do it. I like. I, it's so much better than the alternative. Truly, don't you don't want to renounce your citizenship and go through the bullshit. You don't. You don't. You really don't. I. Huh, yeah. So I. This is. Been, it's been a weird one. This has been a weird one, man. Because I don't. And if you're traveling for a business conference and the people at the other end of the conference are convincing you that it'll be okay because they won't stamp your passport, pause for a moment. Pause for at least one moment and think. And look, I've never had the opportunity to do it. I, in some sense, wish I have. Like, back in the day when Americans couldn't travel, I think it's changed now, when Americans couldn't travel to Cuba at all, people would be like, yeah, man, you go to Mexico, then you fly to Cuba, and they don't stamp your passport, and then you go back. And I was like, that sounds sketch. (laughs) Like, that was why I didn't do it, because it sounded sketch, but I'm sure it worked for thousands and thousands of Americans every year. I'm sure it was totally fine. And if you're a tourist who just wants to go visit a place that you're not supposed to go to, I'm much more empathetic with that than whatever the fuck this was, which is just craziness. Craziness. Again, the basic shit, don't do illegal stuff. If you're going to do illegal stuff, don't document it. Don't send it through text messages and emails. Don't send it to, like, six different people. Don't get your picture taken in a North Korean uniform next to a whiteboard that says, no sanctions, yay. (sighs) I don't know how we have to explain this to anybody, but apparently we do. Um, So, you know, please don't do crime. And if you do, don't document your crime. Uh, But I, I, you know, I think it sucks. I'm, I don't feel good about what's going on with Virgil. I'm not, like, running around in circles going, like, ha-ha, gotcha. It's a bummer. Wish he didn't have to face this much time. I'm sure I would never like this kind of person if I met him. He sounds very full of himself. But um, I also don't think anybody should go to jail for something so— or at least not spend five years in jail or prison for something so— uh, seemingly trivial uh so that's my last take i don't know if you have anything else you want to add but largely the same thing this guy clearly wasn't a hero was clearly doing things he knew he shouldn't have been doing but yeah it does seem unfortunate that he ends up spending five years in a federal prison because he shared information and described things that were accurately possible with the technology yeah yeah it's yeah it's not ideal (laughs) Yeah, it's fucked up on all ends. Let's not help North Korea and the Kims, um, but also let's not give jail time to people who just talk theoretically about stuff or at least don't give them long jail sentences. It's really silly. Uh, Anyway, that's going to do it for another episode of Crypto Critics Corner. I am no longer on probation, but uh, Bennett said that I I won't be able to receive a paycheck for the next six years, which is That's like a true. weird timeline. Uh, it's a long timeline, but uh, I guess he said I still get to keep my equity, so I'm, I'm cool with that, whatever. 